Thank you very much. Am I, am I sliding up to... There we go. Brilliant. Um, so I, I will say I had uh, a small bit of trepidation when I saw the program today. Um, and I thought, wow, we're talking about the universe. We're talking about life. We're talking about coffee, which in many ways and to many people is actually life. <laughs> and I appreciated that our last speaker said that cosmetologists are historians, though I hasten to reassure him that not all historians are cosmetologists. <laughs> or, <laughs> um, cosmologists, yeah, not, not cosmetologists. <laughs> not cosmeto there is not a single cosmetologist here <laughs> that I am aware of, <laughs> though we welcome all. Um, all right, let's go ahead and start the talk, shall we? <laughs> shall we? Um, all right, so women began gathering in front of a warehouse in Boston early on the morning of July 24th, 1777, just about a year after the Declaration of Independence had passed. At times, there were just a few. By mid-morning, there were more then dozens, and by the time the building's owner, a merchant named Thomas Boylston, arrived on the scene, more than a hundred women were there to greet him and demand to be let in. For years, the city's residents had been complaining about the cost of their daily grocery shopping, and not without good cause. Since Boston had passed a non-importation agreement uh, in 1768 to protest the Townsend duties, storekeeper stocks had steadily dwindled. The situation only got worse after the outbreak of war. Imported commodities like sugar and molasses became scarce first, and then even local staples like flour and beef and pork and butter uh, became scarce, and what you could find was really, really expensive. Abigail Adams was in Boston during these years when her husband John was here in Philadelphia, and she frequently wrote to him about the challenges of living in a city under siege, as well as the growing animosity against importers and retailers who some thought were part of the problem. There is a general cry against the merchants who tis said have created a partial scarcity, she wrote. Every article, not only of luxury, but even the necessaries of life, had become scarce. The women that Boylston confronted that morning in 1777 came with one very specific necessity in mind. Coffee. Now, I'm going to guess, I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that coffee is probably not the caffeinated beverage that most of you think of when you think about the American Revolution. <laughs> but by the time of this standoff, coffee was so popular with North Americans that colonial legislators had been trying to fix its price to avoid exactly the kind of price gouging that these women accused Boylston of practicing. Just eight months before the standoff, Delegates from Massachusetts had met with their representatives in New Hampshire, in Rhode Island, and in Connecticut to try to alleviate the burden of what they called extravagant prices resulting from the unbounded avarice of many persons. And the same lists were replicated in New York and in Pennsylvania. Among the 20 goods singled out for special consideration was coffee, and it was in very good company. Sugar and rum also made the list, as did wheat, rye, pork, salt, beef, cotton, not tea, not tea. The Act to Prevent Monopolies, it's a very catchy title. The Act to Prevent Monopolies and Oppression by Excessive and Unreasonable Prices passed on the last day of 1776, and it set the price of good coffee at one shilling and four pence per pound. The same legislation gave select men in these cities the ability to search stores and warehouses of suspected violators, confiscate overpriced goods, and then sell them to the public at regulated rates. Those convicted of inflating prices could, in addition to having this confiscation occur and the loss of their property, um, suffer the additional indignity of public shaming with their names and addresses posted in the local paper for all to see. 
and I actually love the way this one is phrased, which is why I picked it out, uh, found at Samuel Cook's store in Watertown by the selectmen and committee a cask of coffee. Uh, this is to give notice to the owners to come and sell it out to the inhabitants. And they also had salt and various other things. But selectmen could only be in so many places at once, and potential profits tempted merchants to sometimes take the risk. Uh, it was in these cases that the public stepped in to mete out their own form of justice. And in fact, several Boston and Salem stores had been suspected of hoarding coffee and ransacked in the months leading up to the confrontation with Boylston. Taken together, these efforts to regulate the behavior of coffee's vendors and stage protests to confiscate caches when all else failed reveal how widespread its consumption had become in North America by the 1770s. Coffee drinking was not the practice of a privileged few. It had become the daily and the demanded habit of many. Now, at first glance, this coffee riot seems to resemble the far better known colonial escapade with tea, which has become one of the famous stories um, handed down from the American Revolution. And this is where we enter the audience participation moment <laughs> of today's talk. By a show of hands, who's heard of the Boston Tea Party? <laughs> okay, great, I feel better. By a show of hands, who had heard about Boston's coffee riots? <laughs> Excellent and not surprising, Mary Beth Norton. Well played. <laughs> I'm surprised my husband didn't raise his hand, too, because <laughs> you'd heard all about them. Um, excellent, excellent. The Boston Tea Party had taken place just a few years earlier, and it championed the efforts of a handful of underdog patriots, I'm giving you the traditional rendition, in their quest for self-determination against the vast machinery of empire. Uh, this is the version that has been passed down. It has all of the elements of a really good story. It has disguises, it has bravery, it has an underdog, it has a clearly defined enemy, in this case, British East Indian tea, as well as a pithy rallying cry, no taxation without representation, actually uttered 10 years earlier by either James Otis or Patrick Henry, regardless, uh, depending on whose account you believe, uh, and it was actually in reaction to the Stamp Act, but don't quibble with the details. No taxation without representation. Like most slogans, however, uh, this one reduces complex historical events to easily digestible sound bites that mask a much more complicated reality. Tea was a powerful symbol, both for British authorities who wanted to break colonial defiance and for colonists who sought to control their ports and customs houses, but as the showdown between Boylston and the women confronting him demonstrate, more than one commodity caused colonists consternation. Moreover, while the Boston Tea Party was about limiting consumption, Boston's coffee rioters sought the opposite, access to more. What coffee and tea did share on the eve of revolution was the need to import them. Neither plant grew in North America, and it was not, despite the efforts of many botanists, until the United States annexed Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines in the 19th century, at the end of the 19th century, that the nation had a domestic, domestic supply of either beverage. Um, and yet both goods had a long and loyal following. Tea drinking did not end after the American Revolution. Indeed, tea drinking persisted during the war. This is one of my favorite quotes by Peter Oliver, an associate justice in the Massachusetts Superior Court, who was amused to see um, what he says, a circle of women around a tea table with either a coffee pot or a chocolate pot in the center, filled neither with coffee nor with chocolate, um, and the women choosing a, a, a cup of chocolate or a cup of coffee when they were really, of course, still drinking tea. But coffee supporters um, existed as well, and indeed there were both more coffee drinkers, and because it was much less expensive, a broader range of coffee drinkers um, by the late 18th century, who relied on the coffee plantations of the Caribbean and, of course, the enslaved populations who worked them to provide them what they wanted in ever larger amounts. As a result, I argue, North American culture, and by extension its commerce, remained tied to the economies of the Atlantic world. 
Now, this is not a unique argument. There had been uh, important industrial growth in North America before 1776, but most people's furniture, cloth, metalwares, ceramics, several kinds of food and drink still came from overseas by the time we were discussing independence from Britain. But coffee illustrates in a way that few other commodities ha can how much the colonies of British North America and then the United States invested in industries that ensured that such patterns would widen and deepen. America's dependence, in other words, endured well after the political rift with Britain ended. And this is not the revolutionary legacy that most of us are used to hearing. U.S. citizens have long seen themselves as independent and industrious. Indeed, references to independence shape the traditional national narrative about all aspects of the continent's development after 1776, the establishment of new forms of government, the rise of domestic economies, exploration across the continent. We have some really great objects about that, by the way, in the library and the museum. Creation of urban manufacturing centers, construction of large-scale transportation networks that connected all of these developments and made possible waves of migration that linked the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. And if you're teaching the US survey, I've just covered from about 1776 to 1823 or so. Um, more recently, however, such celebratory narratives have been tempered by historians who try to calculate the cost of this progress on the environment as well as studies that highlight those who were routinely, systematically, and deliberately left out of the independence project. Such challenges to foundational notions of independence, however, often face resistance and efforts to shift deeply held ideas about the nation's origins move slowly. Working hand in hand with ideas of independence are crafting, in crafting Americans' image of themselves and their heritage are those of self-reliance, another US cultural touchstone. The image of a strong, autonomous new nation has ebbed and flowed over the last two centuries but never disappeared. And tea plays very nicely in this sandbox, so much so that in 2009, it once again was adopted by members of a modern tea party purportedly championing limited government and individual responsibility. Coffee disrupts this narrative. The trajectory of how and when coffee became popular, the backstory to its omnipresence on US breakfast tables and afternoon snack rooms at the American Philosophical Society could not be more different. While tea was controlled through a single monopoly charter, coffee had a global network of suppliers by the second half of the 18th century. All European empires, the British, the French, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch, had Atlantic colonies that supplied them with coffee. And West African nations and East Indian sources expanded the global market further still. But regardless of where North American traders chose to do business, Importation remained key. Every cup of colony enjoyed by any mainland colonist and later US citizen had been brewed from beans that came from somewhere else. And in this sense, coffee's spectacular popularity and profitability is the antithesis of autonomy. Every step of the industry's development relied on outside support and external influences. Coffee first came to the Caribbean in the 1720s, in large part because European governments were trying to circumvent their reliance on Middle Eastern and North African brokers, and they hoped that coffee farms would encourage the migration of aspiring small-scale farmers to the West Indies. But progress was slow. Indeed, so few would-be British initially risked investing in coffee that Parliament drastically cut duties in 1732 and kept domestic taxes low and foreign taxes high for the next 100 years, including voting to reduce the tax on coffee in 1773 in the same session that they passed the Tea Act protecting East India Company's monopoly. In fact, for a few short months, these two twin acts um, meant that coffee could serve as a kind of patriotic proxy. One English visitor to Alexandria, Virginia on July 4th, 1774, witnessed the election of town Burgesses and later recorded in his diary, in the evening, the returned member, who was George Washington, 
gave a ball to the freeholders and gentlemen of the town. This was conducted with great harmony, coffee and chocolate, but no tea. This herb is a disgrace amongst them at present. Even the Boston Tea Party had its coffee moment when William Russell, a school teacher who participated in the uprising, reputedly emptied his family's tea canister into the fire and wrote coffee on one side and no tea on the other. But in 1774, North Americans added Caribbean commodities, the British West Indies, to their embargo of British goods, effectively ending coffee's use as an icon of insurgents. And by 1777, after receiving Abigail's account of the Boylston coffee debacle, John Adams wrote back expressing his hope that females will leave off their attachment for coffee, as it created, he argued, an untenable economic dependence on foreign trade. I assure you, he concluded, that the best families in this place, Philadelphia, have left off in great measure the use of West India goods. We must bring ourselves to live upon the produce of our own country. But of course they didn't. Coffee can be found nearly everywhere in the late colonial period and the years of the early republic, but this very commonness, while clear evidence of social and cultural acceptance, also complicates its study. Most references are brief. A record that someone drank coffee on a particular Sunday or went to the coffee house on Tuesday to catch the latest commercial news. I pulled just a few examples of what we have here at the APS for you this afternoon. Example one, Benjamin Franklin. You have to start with Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was a printer. Um, not news to those assembled here. But did you know that he also sold coffee? Admittedly, not a major part of his business, but coffee's durability and stable price during most of the colonial period meant that at times it served as a substitute, suitable kind of currency. On one occasion, Franklin accepted 290 pounds of coffee uh, from Jamaica for almanacs worth just over 16 pounds, um, and later sold another batch of almanacs, um, 800 books, and 1,000 sheets of paper for 590 pounds of coffee. In fact, the APS Franklin Philadelphia Ledger's project, spearheaded by David Nelson of the Center for Digital Scholarship here at the APS, and available on any computer terminal or smartphone near you, um, and which was sadly not available when I was originally doing this research as a graduate student, uh, tells me that Franklin sold coffee 21 times, spelled in various ways, between 1739 and 1748. Example number two. There is also good evidence that Franklin imbibed himself. I have to admit that this is a recent find and entirely accidental. The assistant director of museum and library operations, Brenna Holland, had pulled a letter that Franklin wrote to his wife while in France in which he describes a fine jug for beer that he was sending home. Brenna was attracted to Franklin's description of the jar, which is, and it's near the top, but I don't expect you to read it. Um, it was, I fell in love with it at first sight as I thought it looked like a fat, jolly dame clean and tidy with a blue and white calico gown, good natured and tidy and put me in mind of somebody dot dot dot. She thought it was charming the way he was describing his wife. I don't know if I would like to be described as a beer jar. I don't recommend it. My husband is here present. My eye was immediately drawn to the next sentence. It has the coffee cups in the belly packed in the best crystal salt of a peculiar nice flavor for the table. So he was sending back home China from France for his home. Example number three, Benjamin Smith Barton. And just for giggles, this is Benjamin Franklin's handwriting, this is Benjamin Smith Barton's handwriting, and there is a special place in hell for people who wrote like this in the 18th century. <laughs> there is even good evidence that coffee had become so common that consumers were beginning to distinguish by type, primarily by where it had been grown and roasted as this affected the taste. Um, in the papers of Benjamin Smith Barton, uh, a very well-known Philadelphia botanist, is a small note advising a friend that coffee from the ports of Mocha and Java was best, followed by that produced from French islands. Coffee, and this is the bit that you'll see here, from Jamaica, well, you would if you really, you could. It is what it says. No one can dispute me because it looks like this. No. <laughs> coffee from Jamaica, uh, he thought, should be avoided as it was rumored that their coffee diffused a most unpleasant odor. Rarely is this evidence more than fleeting, but cumulatively these details carry weight, 
since they offer clues about the economic and diplomatic systems upon which North American trade relied, as well as the social and cultural customs that created new kinds of dependence as the United States sought to find its footing in the world after 1783. Most importantly, Coffee Story raises questions about just how much independence the new nation actually enjoyed. And my last slide, I want to leave you with a few parting thoughts. From just over 4 million pounds imported in 1789, the importation of coffee had grown to 54 million pounds by 1794. It was more than four times that by the end of the first quarter of the 19th century. Where it comes from is changing radically. In 1802, only $1.5 million uh, in value had come in from British sources. Eight million had come in from non-British sources. If you fast forward that to 1825, again, the income has more than quadrupled, and it is coming now exclusively, almost exclusively, not exclusively, almost exclusively from Brazil. Um, all of these things put together in comparative perspective means by the early 19th century, North Americans made more money trading coffee, bringing it in, and re-exporting it to the world than they did from sugar, tea, or wine combined. These are astonishingly high figures from something they could not produce for themselves. By any measure, the coffee industry is a financial success story, but distribution, not production, lies at the heart of this tale. If North Americans' rejection of tea symbolized freedom, in other words, their embrace of coffee dictated international dependence. Thank you. Fascinating. Thanks so Thank much. Uh, questions? Questions for Michelle? Ah, Linda. Oh, not Linda. Oh, no, no, Linda's right there. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to oh make God. a comment in addition to asking a question. But you didn't use my absolute favorite quote from John Adams when he went to an uh, inn in Maine when yes. he was riding the circuit and he was exhausted and he asked the innkeeper for a cup of tea and was told, no, we don't serve tea, I'll serve you coffee. And so he had coffee and he wrote to Abigail, I bore it very well. Yes. No, no, no. <laughs> that is one of my favorite quotes. It is in the book manuscript. That okay. one is there. It is there. Okay. Um, but I did have a question, too, which is about the um, processing of the coffee. Mm -hmm. When the Americans imported the beans, were, had they already been roasted, or were they roasted here the way that some of the rum, you know, the rum, of course, was basically created in 18th century North America? I wonder if coffee was roasted here, too. Don't know the answer to that. Um, it's an excellent question. Most of the coffee that came in was dried, but not necessarily roasted. Um, some of it was. You could also see advertisements for green coffee, so we know that wasn't roasted, and different cities had different preferences for how it came in. But there's also um, a significant increase in the number of personal home roasters that are showing up by the late 18th and early 19th centuries, and instructions that appear in recipe books for how to roast coffee. So we know that increasingly they're doing that roasting here. So I'm Barbara Yatsak from Berkeley. Uh, thanks for that fascinating uh, explanation of coffee. Um, I was very taken by your description that uh, coffee was a, a good early example of uh, Americans doing well by logistics. Mm. And I was wondering, are there other historical examples from that time that uh, showed us uh, doing well in logistics? How do you mean by logistics? Well, Tell the uh, importation from oh, someplace. Yes. Uh, yeah collecting it, and then re-exporting it, I would call that logistics. Oh, yes. No, absolutely. Um, yes. In fact, if you look at the, um, the commercial trade records for, for the early United States, they have separate categories for exports and re-exports. Um, so there's a significant number of commodities that they're bringing in from elsewhere or commodities that are coming in, being transformed, and then being re-exported. Um, but coffee really is one of those dominant commodities. Um, it's, it's, for them, um, one of the largest, I think it's by the 18-teens, 10% um, of the overall export income is coming from coffee, and 25% of the re-export income is coming from coffee. Um, and these are very, very large figures, again, for a uh, commodity that we, that we could never produce ourselves. We tried. We failed repeatedly. Um, uh, but, it is, but there is definitely other industries where, where re-exports are important. 
Linda, <coughs> excuse me. Go ahead. Linda Greenhouse, uh, Stockbridge, Massachusetts. So are there any contemporaneous accounts of what it was about coffee, other than that it wasn't tea, that people actually liked? Was it, <laughs> was it the caffeine charge? Was it, I mean, did, are there any documents where people describe the pleasure they actually got from the coffee? Oh, absolutely. Um, you can find those going back to the 17th century when they're building. There was an established coffee culture, um, but really, as the, as the colonies were still forming. So you can find personal letters and diaries where people are sharing how they, um, how they drink coffee, what sorts of additives they put in them. Milk, we know, comes in early. Um, sugar comes in early. Honey comes in early. But there's also um, a real... Uh, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Retention of thinking about spices that are um, in the way that we think of Turkish coffee now that also infiltrates into, into Western Europe um, and then also into North America. But the, there's also a significant medical literature that does also talk about um, coffee as, uh, as good for, um, well, some of them are more farcical than others, but coffee is good for irritable stomachs. Coffee is good for pregnant women. Coffee is good for, I know, coffee is good for... <laughs> I'm not saying it was good medical advice. It was medical <laughs> advice. Um, coffee as good for, um, for, for energy. Uh, it definitely became associated with labor um, and productivity. Um, uh, um, then there's also there's a good established literature that, that denigrates coffee for various reasons. Um, there's, a, there's a really classic um, pamphlet from the uh, early 17th century that was women's decrying coffee and its impact on men. And I'll leave that there um, <laughs> uh, for you to consider, but I'm sure you can draw your own conclusions. I, we have a question up. Yeah, up Michael stairs. McCormick, uh, Cambridge, Mass. I wonder whether the uh, statement by uh, Adams uh, um, about uh, framing the problem of coffee as an import-export issue to be addressed uh, might not have veiled uh, a more direct uh, concern with weakening the wealth of the very wealthy New England loyalists whose wealth was being produced on the plant in the plantation economy of the West Indies uh, and were playing an important war in the re a root, um, role in the revolution. No, you're absolutely right, um, and he, his comment was not uncontested. Uh, there was, um, in fact, in, in the manuscript, it's put in contest with others who are arguing that, uh, that uh, ceasing trade with the West Indies would be financially ruinous um, for the colonies. They recognized very much, um, both not only in New England, but, but certainly in Pennsylvania. And I will say that Pennsylvania became the leading importer of coffee in the, in the colonial era anyway. It shifts to Baltimore and, and other places, ultimately down to even places as far south as New Orleans in the 19th century. Um, but in the 18th century, Philadelphia is the leading coffee importer, primarily because places like Boston and New York had already heavily invested in the sugar industry um, and, and its derivatives, molasses and, and rum. Um, but there was a very clear understanding um, of the economic relationship between these two parts of the British Empire, um, and that in choosing to try to promote this by American um, rather than importing foreign goods, um, it was going to be having a significant economic impact um, on people on both sides of the political spectrum. Okay, I think with that we're going to have to, uh, we have one more, and this will be our last question. I'll try and be brief. Solomon Katz, uh, Philadelphia. Uh, the issue is, of course, the history of coffee before King George that, that we need to understand in order to really put it all into perspective. So I'm wondering, I guess, first, if you would comment on the things preceding it. And then the second issue was, I assume that for most of the colonial, uh, particularly the ones that we're referring to in, in the history of this, uh, th those who rebelled against the, the king, that in a sense, drinking coffee was was not just thumbing your nose, but putting your thumb in, in the eye of the king. And I'm wondering to what extent that motivated a lot of this, uh, um, you know, behavior that we see. Well, uh, let me ask you your second your second question first. It was again up until the time that we included. Um, British Caribbean commodities in the non-importation agreements. And then drinking coffee was no more patriotic than drinking tea. Um, and so both really were supposed to be prohibited. Um, your earlier question, I'm going to, in the deference of time, leave you with a teaser. Um, so uh, chapter one of the manuscript, really, it starts in the Caribbean, but in order to really understand why European empires were so invested um, in producing coffee on this side of the Atlantic, you have to understand what the uh, trade looked like in the century and century and a half prior. 
So there's a section that looks at the development of East Indian plantations um, and also that looks at the earlier Middle Eastern trade um, and efforts to try to break these sort of monopolies um, of access to coffee. So I will, I will assure you that that is definitely part of the trajectory because you're absolutely right. To understand why coffee becomes a major part of Atlantic history, you have to understand why um, it was not actually serving the needs anymore of Western European customers in the scale that it was being produced on the other side of the world. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> and welcome to the American Philosophical Society. It's wonderful to have you.